Hello, hello. Welcome all to uh, the book talk tonight. Um, my name is Aki Kotaki. I'm director of the uh, Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Kansas. Today, because of the snow, we are closed on campus, but thanks to the technology, we have all amazing presenters. Um, so tonight's talk is gonna be uh, a book, uh, Chinese uh, Feminism with the Chinese Characteristics, uh, co-edited by Professor Fei Xiao and Pinto. So I am going to introduce tonight's moderator, Professor Keith Markman, and then uh, Professor Markman is gonna um, introduce other presenters. So, um, and also this is a kind of heads up. So this is gonna be uh, uh, webinar. So if you have any questions, you could put your question in on the Q&A. Please do so um, even during the presentation. Okay, um, Keith McMahon has been a professor of Chinese language and literature in East Asian languages and cultures at University of Kansas since 1984. He served as the chair of the department for 12 years and is currently director of graduate studies. He studies the history of sexuality in China from ancient times to the verge of modernity, including most recently a two volume study of the history of imperial marriage and women rulers. A new book will appear in 2023 from the Harvard Asia Center saying all that can be said the art uh, of uh, describing sex in Ping Ping Mei. That's really intriguing. His other areas of interest include polygamy and gender characterization in fictional narrative of late imperial China, mythical and historical narrative from ancient times to the end of the last dynasty, and the culture of opium smoking in 19th century China. His next project will be about Im uh, immortals, demons, and the cosmic geography in the uh, 16th century novel, Journey to the West. So please welcome Professor McMahon. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. I'm really honored to uh, moderate our talk tonight. And uh, just wanna say first, this is a remarkable volume that the result of lengthy and highly cooperative process of study and discussion among the participants, uh, starting with a 2017 conference in the Netherlands and followed by uh, continued discussion and development, including an AAS panel in 2020 and numerous individual presentations. Um, and it's a book that should be read by people both inside and outside the field. And it's a challenging book uh, that takes on challenging questions and, and that, will sh that will and should shake you up when you read it. So let me now introduce our three presenters, uh, beginning with Ping Zhu, uh, is an associate professor of Chinese literature at the University of Oklahoma and serves as acting editor-in-chief of Chinese literature today. Uh, she is the author of Gender and Subjectivities in Early 20th Century Chinese Literature and Culture, uh, the co-editor with Zhu Yi Wang and Jason McGrath of Maoist Laughter uh, which won Choice's Outstanding Academic Title. And again, uh, and, and, and of course, the co-editor with Fei of uh, Feminisms with Chinese Characteristics. And she's currently working on a monograph on the discourse of labor in modern China. And then next is Fei Xiao, uh, my colleague here at Kansas. You know, she's professor and chair, uh, professor just last year, promoted last year, and chair of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Um, uh, here and uh, besides co-editing the book we're talking about tonight, she's the author of two books, Family Revolution, Marital Strife in Contemporary Chinese Literature and Visual Culture, and also Youth Economy, Crisis and Reinvention in 21st Century China, Morning Sun in the, Ti in the Tiny Times. And her recent research includes uh, Youth Culture and Economy in 21st Century China, Chinese Feminist Theories and Practices Under Globalization, as well as cultural representations and gender and class politics of women leaders in modern Chinese society. Currently, she's working on a third monograph tentatively titled The Hen Cackles in the Morning, Gendered Soundscape and Female Leadership in Modern Chinese Literature and Culture. 
And uh, our third uh, speaker tonight is uh, Xu Jin Sui, uh, a, a Bowdoin, Bowdoin Professor of Asian and Cinema Studies, at, 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 whose research interests focus on gender politics, but involve areas across many fields, including cinema studies, culture studies, and visual art studies. Her first book, Women Through the Lenses, Gender and Nation in a Century of Chinese Cinema, discusses the appropriation of women in 20th century China. And she's added to her collection of works with her second book, Gendered Bodies Toward a Women's Visual Art in Contemporary China, as well as an edited volume of Engendering Women's Art in Contemporary China, which explores women artists and the portrayal of the female body. She's completing another manuscript, which is titled Ecological and Environmental Turns, Remapping China's Social Environmental Landscapes Through the Lenses of Eco Cinema. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to our, our speakers and they'll talk in turns and then we'll leave some time at the end for uh, audience uh, question and discussion. So uh, I will be the first speaker. Uh, and I first I want to say thank you very much, Professor McMahon for the introductions and for the nice words, of course, about this new volume. Uh, I'm holding in my hand. Uh, and also I want to thank the East Asian uh, Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Kansas for your invitation, for your wonderful organization. Uh, let me share screen of the PPT. I'm going to control the PPT for uh, both my talk and the face talk. Uh, I think everyone can see the PPT, right? Okay, so, and, and I already uh, have seen a lot of uh, names of uh, old and new friends. So thank you all for coming to this uh, talk. Uh, like Professor McMahon just introduced, this volume uh, basically uh, started, we started to conceive this volume in 2017 uh, during an ACLA conference in Netherlands. And uh, a lot of things actually have changed to the landscape of Chinese feminism from, uh, from 2017 to now, right? Uh, a few days ago, I just heard the last feminist group basically was uh, in China was uh, censored online. So uh, the cracking down of the Chinese feminist group started before, nine, uh, before 2017. And that was the period when Fei and I uh, wanted to uh, try to theorize and evaluate the explosive scene of Chinese feminist landscape. Uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm glad this volume came out uh, in 2021, the December 2021, uh, which actually I think is a a milestone, uh, it's a, like a milestone uh, time period for Chinese feminism, starting the 1995 World, or, uh, uh, the World uh, Women's Organization in Beijing to uh, 2021. Let's see, it's, a, it's a, a historical period we want to summarize and theorize in this volume. And the two keywords, uh, first the structure of the talk, I will talk about the titles meaning what, or what feminisms with Chinese characteristics mean. And then Fei will talk about genealogy of Chinese feminism in, uh, in post-1995 developments. And then I will, I will talk about the feminist politics of, uh, with Chinese characteristics. And then Fei will give a summary of each chapter. And then we have a special guest, Professor uh, Cui Shuqing, who will talk about the book cover because the, uh, the mesmerizing artwork on the book cover already has attracted a lot of questions. So we will let uh, Professor Cui to talk about that directly. Um, and then feminism, one of the words in the title is feminism. And uh, we don't have one singular translation for feminism in Chinese. It can be nu chuan zhu yi, zhu yi, meaning women's rights ism, or nu xing zhu yi, woman ism. Or uh, during the socialist period, actually, the, uh, the, basically no one used nu chuan zhu yi or nu xing zhu yi. People just used fu nu jie fang, women's liberation, or nan nu ping den, equality between men uh, and women. Uh, nu chuan zhu yi was uh, used already in the early 20th century China, nu chuan, uh, and it, it was uh, at that time people, uh, Chinese women and the Chinese male intellectuals as well, they wanted basically to, uh, uh, they wanted to request free marriage, for example, and uh, free rights to inherit uh, inherit property, uh, the rights to education, the rights to work, a lot of these things. 
Uh, and it basically is also a word, a, a term that, that would be used today in, uh, in contemporary China, this, despite the interruption of the socialist period. And the second word, womanism, uh, became prominent actually right after the socialist period. Uh, and uh, at that time, the pre predominant use was for women's special needs and the consciousness. And it gained prominence in 1980s with the rise of women's studies in China, in mainland China. And one of the leading a Chinese scholar for Nu Xing Zhu Yi is Li Xiaojiang, and she is a contributor uh, of this volume as well. Neither of these terms during, uh, uh, like I said, neither Nu Xing Zhu Yi or Nu Quan Zhu Yi were used during the socialist period because they were regarded as associating with the bourgeois uh, class, bourgeois interests. And from the different terms, different translations for feminism, you can actually, we can actually perceive a kind of dilemma in Chinese feminist practices, which is, uh, do feminists want to fight for specificity or do they want to fight for equality, right? Different feminist groups obviously have different agendas and appeals. Um, and this actually reminds me of uh, Nancy Fraser's talk in the, uh, in the article from this redistribution to recognition, dilemmas of justice in the post-socialist age. She asks, where, where is the logic of this uh, distribution is to put gender out of business as such? The logic of recognition is to valorize gender specificity. How can feminists fight simultaneously to abolish gender dis differentiation and to valorize gender specificity? So this is a complex question that all feminists and women in the world must face and must answer. What is the Chinese answer to this dilemma then? Uh, is this is something we want to explore in this volume. And when we try to understand and evaluate this dazzling picture of multi, multi furious Chinese feminisms in contemporary China and also historically, I believe we are not only tackling a challenge to all feminists, in the world, but also exploring a valuable asset that the Chinese history can offer to feminisms at large. And the other key word is Chinese characteristics in the title. And there are different versions of Chinese characteristics in history. The, uh, the first appearance of this word that I can find is a neologism. Actually, it was a neologism invented by Westerners in the late 19th century. For example, I found this um, uh, English political economist and writer John Bowring's Chinese characteristics. It's an article, it was published in 1865 in the Catholic world. And then, uh, uh, the famous, the more famous version, which is on the, the, the image on the left, is uh, American missionary Arthur Henderson Smith's Chinese characteristics. It was published in Shanghai in 1890, and, and it was very uh, widely circulated in China and East Asia. Um, the first edition even sold out <laughs> uh, in a few years. And in those, in those writings, Chineseness was racialized, oftentimes in a negative way as a result of the colonial encounter. And the new culture reformers and the late, later socialist revolutionaries both set out to reform the Chinese tradition, namely the Chinese characteristics under the Western gaze following the Western model and the Marxist paradigm uh, respectively. And on the, on the right side of the screen, you can see uh, in, in 1984, when Deng Xiaoping met a, a Japanese delegation, he emphasized in the talk that Marxism must be integrated with reality in China and socialism must be geared to the Chinese reality too. Since then, the phrase Chinese characteristics has become the official translation of Chinese characteristic as it appears in the abstract Socialism with Chinese characteristics. This episode justifies China's integration into the world capitalist system in the post-socialist period under the premise that the CCP remains the sole ruling party of China, which signals the state's insistence on its uh, monopoly on explaining and defining Chinese society. 
whether as a racialized term or as a political guideline, Chinese characteristics presupposes a binary structure, be it East or West, traditional uh, or modern, or socialism or, or capitalism. From a grand perspective, the history of 20th century China is a history when the binary structures and the patriarchal uh, hierarchies embedded in the abstract Chinese characteristics were challenged, dismantled, and replaced by constantly renewed feminist ideas and practices across multiple centers and peripheries created by the patriarchal powers. Fei will give you a genealogy of Chinese feminist practice practices soon, right after, uh, in a few minutes, actually. So you will, you will hear why Chinese feminisms have been, uh, have been challenging the binary structure, structures historically. And one of the main purpose of this volume is to show that Chinese feminisms must remain plural. Plurality is the effective strategy for subverting the systematic oppressions that oftentimes exercise their power through creating, maintaining, and consolidating binary structures. Um, the imperative for Chinese women, as Lisa Rofel puts it, is that they need to rise above, as I quote, rise above the generalizations about uh, women to become subjects of a counter history. So uh, end of quote. So plur plurality, plurality on, on one hand uh, means that you have to challenge the binary structure from a different perspective, a counter history perspective. On the other hand, it does not mean replacing the critique of the systematic problems with fragmented strategies. Rather, it invents pluralistic systematic thinking. For example, Dai Jinghua has proposed a broader definition of feminism as, quote, the search for different worlds and alternative possibilities other than global capitalism. And as she said, through women's, especially third world women's thinking of nationalism, reveal the plurality of historical practices so as to open broader space for thoughts, criticisms, and social practices. End of quote. So this is Dai Jinghua's broader definition of feminism. Nuxingzhuyi, actually, in her own uh, term, Nuxingzhuyi uh, ha uh, has been used as a very broad term by her. Um, so the lesson from feminism with Chinese characteristics is that pluralistic thinking and practices must not reject totalities and exclude concerted actions. I will explain this later in, in my second part of the talk. And I want to use uh, one more minute to show you this recent article and the two images, which are, 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 they are viral on Chinese internet recently. One is uh, Ilin Gu, right, the Winter Olympic medalist. The other on the bottom is the chained woman in uh, Xuzhou, Jiangsu province. And uh, New York Times has published this essay, which is titled, Who is the Real China? Ilin Gu or the chained woman. So I, I want to show you these two images because they impel us to ask, what is Chineseness, right? Who can be the subject of Chinese feminisms? What is the end goal of Chinese feminist movements? Gu is a symbol of the competition between two superpowers, and she's hotly pursued by the capital, while this chained woman in Xuzhou is suffering from gender violence, remnant feudal ideology, poverty, the unbalanced gender ratio in China, and a misogynist government, to name just a few. So the vast differences between these two women suggest the systematic problems cannot be tackled alone on the individual level uh, or the family level even. It has to be tackled simultaneously on multiple levels at the same time uh, to continue the liberating potential of Chinese feminisms for all Chinese women. Therefore, we must keep identifying and problematizing contemporary configurations of patriarchal power in its multifarious and intersecting forms. So uh, I have one more page to show, and this is basically uh, uh, our uh, proposition. We want to use a broader term of feminism to open up the binary structures of Chinese, fem uh, Chinese characteristics. Uh, and uh, we propose uh, Chinese feminisms as a uh, basically a contributing contributing actor in the transnational transnational feminist movement. 
uh, and the plurality is precisely the strength of Chinese feminisms in plural, okay. So this is uh, my first part of, of my talk and I, I'm going to shift to Fei. Fei, are you ready? And yeah. she will talk <laughs> about the genealogy of Chinese feminisms. Okay, thank you, Ping, for um, explaining the meaning of the title and also for setting the table. And, and also thanks to uh, the Center for East Asian Studies for organizing this joint book talk. And, 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 and thanks to Keith for uh, giving very nice introductions about the book and also about the three speakers tonight. So I'm going to uh, talk a, a bit more, I, I guess a very brief genealogy given the time constraints of Chinese feminisms. So the Chinese, the birth of Chinese feminisms can be traced back to the turn of the 20th century when China was faced with a series of military defeats and the foreign invasions and economic crisis. So Chinese elites was seeking new ways to start China sinking into a backwater colony in this colonial capitalist world system. So progressive Chinese male intellectuals and the political activists turned to a nationalist or feminist agenda. They advocated for female education, abolition of food binding, a new sexual morality, and even gynocentrism. Uh, in the hope that women can live a healthier and, and happier life so and, and, and then contribute to the birth of a modern nation state and its younger and stronger uh, citizens. For many early male feminists, women's emancipation was part of a larger project of enlightenment and the national self-strengthening. In this historical context, early Chinese feminists were not in direct opposition to the patriarchal society or to men. So talking about, you know, breaking down the binary structure. Uh, instead, they proved the value of their existence through negotiations with or even making concessions to the society, the government, the nation, or even men. So uh, both Rosie Ko and Wang Zheng point out that Chinese feminism is always already a global discourse and the history of its local reception is a history of the politics of translation. In modern China, male authored discourse on women's liberation and female empowerment emerged as a counter discourse to the Western gaze that perpetuated the image of China as woman. As my editor, Professor Zhu's previous study shows, modern Chinese intellectuals in the early 20th century sought to challenge the racialized view of gender hierarchy to change the power structure embedded in this heterosexual dichotomy in the Western gaze and to reject the bio destiny of the Chinese race. Some women writers, activists, and revolutionaries had joined their male peers to advocate gender equity within the nationalist or feminist framework, while others criticized their male chauvinist views on gender history and modern nationhood. So from its very beginning, Chinese feminism could not be understood as, as singular. And uh, the umbrella term of mutual or women's rights uh, anarchist, socialist, liberal, evolutionary, eugenic, and nationalist positions shaped various feminist articulations and cultural imaginations. So Ping, could you please go to the next page? Next slide. So from the first beheaded Chinese feminist martyr Cho Jing to the first Chinese anarchist feminist He Yingzhen, from the new woman to the modern girl, um, from women suffragists to women soldiers to mothers of national citizens, Chinese women were endowed with different identities and agencies, despite the over, over, well, overarching nationalist agenda and the persisting patriarchal system. Many radical May Force feminists later joined the Chinese Communist Party or CCP during the Yan An period and brought their feminist agenda into the core of the party. So women's liberation was a significant part of the uh, Chinese socialist revolution after the Yan An period. Uh, next page, please, Ping. So as Wang Zheng has observed, 
this term, uh, Ping already talked about this, so just uh, to refresh your memory. So this term feminism or Nu Chen Zhu Yi was deemed the true bourgeois during this period, hence the slogans Fu Ni Jie Fang or women's liberation and Nan Nu Ping Deng, equality between men and the women were more favored by the CCP and were listed on the official political agenda. In 1949, the All China Women's Federation was established with its local branch just reaching all the way to the neighborhood level all over China, Women's Federation of Fulian in Chinese. Under the leadership of senior women cadres within the CCP promoted a series of national policies aiming for gender equity, including also um, um, drafting the, the first law in uh, the People's Republic of China. That is not constitution, that is the marriage law. As a result of the state feminism that was spearheaded as a formally institutionalized political campaign, women's social status, literacy rate, educational level, and the workforce and the political participation have all been enormously improved. Next slide, please, Ping. In 2009, the number of female students surpassed that of male students enrolled in college for the first time in Chinese history. And also just a couple of years ago, the female holders of master's degree also surpassed the number of male holders of master's degree in China. And uh, the employment rate among Chinese women aged 16 to 64 is the highest not only in East Asia, but also in the top tier of employment rate for women in the entire world. Although women in the workplace still face sexist discrimination in its various forms, China's gender pay gap is the narrowest in East Asia and also smaller than that of some developed countries, including the United States. The remarkable practices and ideas of socialist feminism were gradually undermined, however, when China embraced a market economy since 1990s, the display of women's studies or Fu Nu Yanzhou in Chinese that emerged in the 1980s in China advocated the drastic economic and theoretical turn toward marketization and globalization. The first generation of women's studies scholars in post-socialist China bid farewell to the era of revolutions. Overall, they deliberately kept a distance from socialist feminism and also Marxist social theories that up upheld the idea of gender equity. Intellectuals in the post-socialist period emphasize rediscovering and the restoring, quote, women's real, natural, feminine singularity, unquote, which is often materialized through individuals' consumer practices and the commodified ways of self-expression. Further appropriating a market individualism discourse, a backlash of patriarchal conservatism devalued the socialist or feminist legacy by condemning Chinese women who grew up in the Mao era as overliberated and thus unfeminine or masculinized. So this was the period when masculinity and the power came together because on the one hand, the criticism of Maoism was from a masculinist perspective. And on the other hand, issues concerning gender division of labor, women's decreasing level of political participation, massive layoffs of women workers and structural inequalities were considered trivial matters and systematically neglected. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk uh, a bit more about the 1995 World Conference on Women and also uh, the rise of NGO feminism in, in China. So the year 1995, when the Fourth World Conference on Women was held in Beijing, marks a historical milestone in the development of the Chinese feminist movement. The conference was attended by more than uh, 17,000 participants. In addition, a parallel NGO forum was opened in Huairou in the northern suburbs of Beijing. It hosted 60 symposiums and 35 exhibitions and drew over 30,000 attendees. The 1995 conference ushered in a new age for the globalization of Chinese feminisms by bringing transnational resources and discourses into Chinese women's studies and the Chinese feminist practices. Following the 1995 World Conference on Women, 
some of the earliest women's NGOs got further development through the support of transnational funding and increased media visibility. In many cases, NGOs and the All China Women's Federation have developed a collaborative relationship to pool resources and carry out their advocacy projects, which must be aligned with national policy and official ideology. This collaboration between NGOs with the Women's Federation has become a distinctive mode of contemporary Chinese feminisms after 1995. These NGOs have spread feminist ideas in China, linked to some Chinese women with the world, and at the same time, greatly transformed the programs, organizations, languages, and the practices of Chinese feminisms. Meanwhile, their unprecedented publicity and transnational networks also alerted the state that the Chinese feminist program exceeded the capacity of the government to control its agenda and interests. So to discuss this transformation of feminist NGOs in the 21st century, another paradigm of Chinese characteristics should also be considered, neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in his book, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, David Harvey portrays the outcome of China's neoliberalization in the post-socialist era as, quote, the construction of a particular kind of market economy that increasingly incorporates neoliberal elements interdigitated with authoritarian centralized control, unquote. This shift to neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics represents the latest alliance of economic neoliberalism and ideological neoconservatism. So while a neoliberal market rationale shapes the reconfiguration of the economic realm and social institutions, centralized management and the containment of public spaces have also been consolidated. In the wake of the paradigmatic transformation of the state's agenda from equity-centered socialist revolution, including women's liberation, toward an efficiency-driven marketization and privatization, women of younger generations working in Chinese feminist NGOs found themselves faced with a different set of gender-specific issues and problems. As a result, the gender programs championed by these younger feminists, who are generally well-educated and urban-based, are often preoccupied with concerns and issues mainly relevant to young urban professionals and appear to be less resonant with working-class women. Although a growing number of feminists have started paying more attention to the intersection of class and gender, not all transnational NGOs are committed to connecting with women of lower classes from different age groups and in the rural areas, for many of whom the socialist legacy is still at work in their conceptualization of gender equity and rights. So the tension between local and the global, between rural and urban, between history and the present, and between academia and activists calls for a new theorization of feminisms with Chinese characteristics beyond those binaries. So which Professor Zhu will continue elaborating more in her second part of, of the talk. Thank you, Fei. Yeah, I'm going to take over again. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, feminist politics with Chinese characteristics. Um, uh, Fei has laid out the genealogy of Chinese feminist practices and ideas in the 20th century. And uh, uh, many of what we talked about can be found in the introduction of our uh, co-edited volume. There's a 34 page introduction that I, I invite you to read. But uh, I want to argue now that pluralistic thinking and intersectional conceptualization, which can be regarded as a special form of plural plurality as well, right? Uh, and these two have been the salient features of Chinese feminist politics throughout the 20th century. Pluralistic thinking and the shifting positions of Chinese feminisms have helped us challenge the various hegemonic forms of patriarchy, such as Orientalism, racism, nationalism, socialism, and in our current age, neoliberal 
capitalism. Uh, and intersectional conceptualization allows feminisms to address the systematically organized totalities that cannot be solved individually or in isolation. Nearly a century ago, the anarchist feminist He Yingzhen conceptualized gender not simply as a form of social identity determined by sexual distinction, but as a mechanism to create forms of power and domination based on the distinction in a structurally unequal society. He Ying's groundbreaking feminist vision suggests that it is far from enough if women only focus on discovering their so-called female consciousness writing about their bodies or narrating their personal histories because women's consciousness, bodies or histories are always and already defined by masculinist versions, uh, visions and the patriarchal power. He Ying used the notion of uh, shenji or livelihood to expose the institution of private property that subjugated women in history and called for the elimination of all capitalists. Her, so her feminist vision was already intersectional. And during the new culture movement, liberalist feminism was uh, already challenged with a Western liberalist version of feminism was challenged by the uh, new, new, uh, new culture intellectuals in China. Uh, we all know that Lu Xun famously asked what would happen to Nora if after she left home, right? And in uh, 19, 19, 19, 1919, Li Dazhao, another new culture leader, he used hypothetical example to show the limit of Western feminist, feminism. Uh, he, he said, if a proletarian woman was deterred, uh, det detained for prostitution, but a woman police officer arrested her and a woman judge interrogated her and a woman lawyer defended her, does that mean that woman question, uh, does that mean the woman question has been resolved, has been solved? Obviously no, right? So, uh, and another May 4th Marxist, uh, Dai Ji Tao, uh, he's, he's one of the earliest Chinese Marxists. He argued in his 2020 essay, it's called uh, The Intersection Between Laborers' Movement and the Women's Movement. In this essay, he, Dai Ji Tao said that most Chinese women could not ob obtain liberation either through women's suffrage movement or obtaining financial uh, independence because they would barely escape the prism of the family before they wear the chains of wage labor. So Dai concluded that only by intersecting the women's question with the labor question could a transformative solution be found. So this is another example of intersectionality in early Chinese feminist thinking. And my first book, uh, Gender and the Subjectivities in Early 20th Century Chinese Literature and the Culture, which Fei already uh, talked about, basically uh, I wanted to explore the centrality of the feminine at the intersection of gender and the race to explore uh, another strength of Chinese feminist ideas and practices through such kind of inter inter intersection. And the intersection between gender and the class continue to dominate the socialist gender ideology. One of the biggest achievements of the socialist state feminists was their effort to redefine women and the femininity not based on gender ideology or not based on gender difference which consequently allowed women to do away with gender difference and claim equal status with men. And two feminist scholars, Chen Shunxing and Dai Jinghua, they co-edited the volume Women, Nation, and Feminism in 2004. This is on the right of the screen. Uh, this indicates that uh, th th this volume indicates the crucial importance of examining the women's question in conjunction with the inequalities perpetuated by the neoliberal world, world, world order formed in the post-colonial era. The intersection of gender and the geopolitics is the strength of this volume. So all these examples show that the Chinese feminism's historical strength of intersectionality and the plurality. However, those historical legacies of Chinese feminisms have faced setback today as they pointed out, when consumerism, individualism, and the feudalism join hands to revive the old binary gender ideology in China. What Chinese feminisms currently face is a postmodern landscape where new Confucianism exists side by side with neoliberalism, where socialist aspirations merge with capitalist expansion and where politics and the culture join hands to cement the traditional gender ideology. And uh, I, I will give a few examples. 
for example, the mistress economy, 二奶经济 or the female virtual school, 女德班 Uh, these were uh really, you know, uh like very odd cultural phenomena in、uh, contemporary China, right? Uh, Dai Jinghua has one interview collected. In this volume, it's、uh, it's talking about the specter of polygamy that has been revived in the contemporary period, and sometimes this kind of、uh, old gender ideology、uh, is revived under the disguise of pursuing personal happiness, pursuing personal achievement, personal success. Right. So we really need to think what. Is feminism what qualifies、uh, as one of the feminist、uh, ideas or or practices in in this sense, and、uh, and another example is、uh, in recent years the hyper masculine personality cult around the top CCP leaders has been revived as well, and I think this quickly finds its cultural representations. In the dozen of popular TV dramas set in the imperial harems,、uh, it's they are called the gong dou ju, right? Or like a、uh, gong dou ju, or the 大女主 like a big, big female, big heroine kind of TV drama, and they portray how concubines in the palace they compete for the emperor's favor,、uh, and uh, in uh, they're they're set in the fantasized dynastic China. So again, are these feminists? Right, we can ask whether these are the feminist、uh, practices we we should、uh, follow or、uh, study. Right. So, but、uh, I'm going to leave it for the discussion session. And also, one more example I want to share is I, I teach Lu Xun's、uh, New Year's sacrifice, for example. And because Xiao Lingxiao, the female protagonist,、uh, she was、uh, she was basically she was、uh, in arranged marriage after the first husband died. Right. And、uh, she com- she tried to commit suicide. So my American students perceive this committing suicide as a as a, a symbol of personal struggle, and some of them, it's not one student, some of them actually called Xiao Lingxiao a feminist because she fought for herself, right? So I hope that with this volume's introduction or all those essays, we can elucidate the question why Xiao Lingxiao cannot be viewed as a feminist, right? Okay, and I, I'm going to talk about the、uh, the important、uh, section in our introduction, which is about the socialist feminism, and、uh, it was in uh, it, it, uh, basically socialist feminism became prominent not long ago, around、uh, 2010, and. Nik Nikola Spakowski, who is one of the contributors in this volume, her study shows that、uh, this is a new theoretical strand、uh, forming in 2020-10, which she called socialist feminism, or sometimes even critical socialist feminism.、Uh, according to、uh, Nik、uh, Spakowski, the difference between the socialist feminists and the new leftists、uh, is the latter remains to be gender blind. They focus only exclusively on the category of class, but not gender. However, the socialist feminists they adopt an intersectional lens when they study the gender problems or the social problems. And、um, socialist feminism is just one of the many feminisms in contemporary China. However, it's important because、uh, the rise of socialist feminism indicates the crucial importance of preserving critiques of systematic problems, such as the inequities perpetuated by the neoliberal world order formed in the post-Cold War era, and the specters of patriarchy revived by the victory of the cap of capital in various social sectors. Quite a few socialist feminists, both in the West and、uh, China, have gone one step further to bombard the complicity between second wave feminism and the neoliberalism. The U.S. feminist、uh, Nancy Fraser, I quoted her already.、Uh, she published this fam- famous essay. It's called "Feminism, Capitalism, and、uh, and the Cunning of History" in two two thousand nine, and this essay was quickly translated into Chinese and、uh, warmly received by the Chinese socialist feminists. Basically,、uh, Fraser's essay、uh, was trying to、uh, was trying to say that claims for justice. Were increasingly couched as claims for the recognition of identities and the differences, without tackling the systematic problems. Song Xiaopeng, another Chinese socialist feminist, she points out that the feminists in China fail to direct their criticism 
at the injustice caused by capitalism and the neoliberalism. Instead, their struggles are limited to individual freedom and the rights and their targets are the state and its policies. So the, the, uh, this is the limit of uh, the other kinds of uh, feminisms, right? One of the historical mission of the plural and intersecting feminisms with Chinese characteristics is to guard off the hegemonic patriarchy in socialist in socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, we all know that socialism with Chinese characteristics seems to have helped China withstand the Asian financial meltdown in 1998 and greatly influenced Chinese policymakers' confidence in the Chinese model. While in the academic world, the reflection on the achievements and the lessons of socialism had started in the 1990s, a popular culture, in popular culture, there uh, emerged a specific form for nostalgia for the uh, socialist, uh, nostalgia for the socialist period. Uh, and in 2012, the CCP started to emphasize four the four self-confidence, which led to a wave of funded studies uh, on socialist culture, literature, politics, and practices. Therefore, although the new leftists' criticism of neoliberal capitalism is valuable, it must maintain a critical distance to the popular nostalgia for socialism or the official political discourse that endorses cultural particularism, as both of them or their subtle coll uh, collusion might lead to the hegemonic, uh, uh, might, might lead to the hegemony of Chinese characteristics in a singular form. Sharon Wysocki has reminded us that male intellectuals' criticism of what means what it means to be modern or to be Chinese is, as I quote, is easily colonized by statist factions in the period in which a thin surface of state socialist ideology coexists with an increasingly neoliberal economic core, end of quote. She also argues that some male intellectuals' cultural nationalist tendencies will enact a post Mao post reform era gender erasure. So now I'm going to give you one example of the post-Mao post -Mao gender erasure. So this is an, another new example I, I took from the, uh, uh, the Chinese rock and the roast uh, in 2020, I believe. Uh, Yang Li, she is, uh, she, she is a famous talk show on the rock and the roast stage, uh, a female talk show performer on the rock and the roast stage. And she was always trying to make jokes about gender antagonism. Right. Uh, however, one of the male intellectuals whose name is uh, Ying Chu, he uh, published uh, a blog essay repudiating Yang Li. He said, uh, like Yang Li's kind of feminism uh, is not real feminism. Uh, they are just uh, they are just uh, bourgeois kind of feminism because these these so called individual uh, in, in, independent women, as I cite from Ying Chu's essay. They just love the rich people and they just wanted to avoid the lower class people. So uh, this man, basically he's trying to use the gender erasure that was uh, a symptom of the socialist period, gender ideology, right, uh, at large. So he was trying to use that, oh, he was trying to use that logic to basically erase the gender, the existence of gender's legitimacy. Um, and, so basically, in conclusion, I'm a little bit over time, right? Uh, in conclusion, so throughout history, the pluralistic and intersecting Chinese feminisms have helped us challenge various hegemonic forms of patriarchy. And only by challenging and opening up Chinese characteristics can we challenge and open up possibilities of an alternative world and create a counter history. So I'm going to shift to Fei. Uh, right now to uh, talk about the layout of the volume. Okay, thank you, Ping. So I'm going to give you, a, a, again, a very brief summary of, of each chapter, and then uh, Professor Cui will talk about her own chapter. So this volume features a hybrid uh, selection of scholarly articles, interviews, and the talks from a representative group of gender studies scholars, women writers, and also activists from mainland China, Hong Kong, the United States, and Europe. The 12 chapters in this interdisciplinary collection 
address the theme of feminisms with Chinese characteristics from different perspectives, painting a pluralistic and panoramic picture of Chinese feminisms in the age of globalization. So they are grouped into three sections, as you can see on, on the screen. So the first section, Chinese feminisms in the age of globalization, consists of four essays that delineate the unique Chinese characteristics of contemporary Chinese feminisms at the interface of local and the global. And both Ping and I have already, you know, covered the many uh, of the of the points uh, in in our previous parts of talk. So this section opens with Nicholas Bakowski's chapter and Ping already talked about, you know, uh, her, her main argument. So this essay demonstrates many ways in which Chinese feminists have consistently used the local essay's frame of reference to negotiate with different kinds of transnational flows, uh, be they economic, cultural or theoretical. So mainly it's about the importing of this new uh, theoretical category uh, gender. So how to translate it and also how to, uh, you know, understand it within this local framework. So the next chapter is a talk given by Li Xiaojiang, founder of the discipline of women's studies in China at the summit forum sponsored by the Women's Institute of Spain in Madrid in 2008. Li points out that gender equality in the historical context of modern China means not only in the sharing of privileges and rights, but also the sharing of hardships between men and women who went through a century of revolutions, wars, and turmoil together. Hence, the Western notion of gender equality fails to connect with the Chinese historical context. So uh, Li Xiaojiang is one of the you know, contemporary Chinese feminists who insists on you know, uh, negotiating uh, with this important idea of gender uh, from the, the local uh, perspective and the local historical context. So in her chapter, uh, Xue Pingzhong challenges the binary opposition between class and women's liberation in the post-socialist period by arguing that Chinese modernity has always been classed and gendered. Zhong demonstrates that this feminist tradition with Chinese characteristics, which is displayed through her comparison between two Chinese films and two Indian films, still lurks in writings by and about contemporary Chinese working class women. The last chapter in this section is a recent interview of Dai Jinghua Ping also already mentioned some of the points uh, Dai made in this interview. So Dai is uh, the most prominent feminist cultural critic in China who alerts us to the specter of poly polygamy resurrected mm -hmm. by the alliance of male dominant power and also transnational capital in 21st century China. That argues that while capitalist logic transcends national borders and the gender divisions, it also dehumanizes men and women alike. It is therefore necessary to reevaluate the legacy of women's liberation in socialist China in the face of global capitalism and neoliberalism. As feminist theories and practices always go hand in hand and fight shoulder to shoulder, the second section centers on feminist struggles on the ground. All three authors in this section are both feminist scholars and also activists. Wang Chen's chapter examines three cohorts of Chinese feminists, including socialist state feminists, NGO feminists around 1995, and the young feminist activists in recent years. To illustrate the shifting settings of and the constant tension over gender equality in China. Li Jun's chapter addresses the question why mainland Chinese male dominant liberals always prioritize human rights over women's rights. Li argues that male intellectuals who are beneficiaries of post-socialist gender and class division continue to uphold the patriarchal heterosexual and the pro-capitalist class position and therefore cannot become a strong ally to Chinese feminists. Using the Chinese adaptations of Eve Ensler's The Vagina Monologues as a case study, Ke Chengting's essay discusses creative linguistic strategies in the localization of this feminist play. These strategies, Ke Chengting argues, are effective ways of articulating Chinese women's plural voices and visions 
promulgating locally produced feminist knowledge and advocacy tactics. The five chapter, uh, the five essays in the final section cover the lit literary, artistic, and the cinematic creations and the representations of contemporary Chinese feminisms. Liu Qingdong's interview of Chinese writer Wang Yi, Am I a Feminist? demonstrates Chinese women's hesitance to identify with Western feminists. According to Wang Yi, the writer, her own female-centered works represent her aesthetic rather than political choices, as well as her reflection on Chinese women's situation in the Chinese historical context. In the second essay, my co-auditor, Professor Zhu draws on Wang Yi's novel, Fu Ping, as an example to show how one constructs a different kind of feminine Shanghai, not one of markets and the commodities, but one of communities and laborers. Zhu argues that the focus on unproductive labor in the story not only is a protest against capitalist consumerism, but also corrects the socialist blind spot for gender. So my own chapter examines the most recent Fan Yu Su phenomenon. Uh, so P next slide, please. So Fan Yu Su is a, is a Baomu or domestic worker who is also a member of the Pichun Migrant Workers Literature Group on the outskirts of Beijing. So here you see two images. So the image on your left, uh, that is uh, the migrant worker, the domestic worker Fan Yu Su and also the worker tent writer. And then the, uh, image on your right, that is a picture of uh, one of the meetings of this uh, Pichun literature group. So in 2017, she published an essay called I am Fan Yu Su on social media, which immediately went viral online and later got reported by state and also international media. Situating thus uh, Fan's auto, autobiographical writing in uh, feminist literary traditions and also the local cultural practices of the migrant workers literature group, I argue that Fan serves a critical link in a new cultural network that is shaped by women workers' immaterial labor and the collective effort in the spirit of an emerging grassroots feminism against the post socialist patriarchy. And then Professor Tui provides a psychoanalytical reading of Zhang Jie's recent massive sculpture installation or 1.5 tons. So, uh, so, so Professor Tui will talk about her own chapter after I introduce the last chapter uh, by Gina Machetti. So lastly, our last chapter, Gina Machetti uh, focuses on the importance of a cosmopolitan vision to the ways in which Hong Kong women filmmakers have depicted feminist movements, women's issues, and the sexual politics on screen, as well as their contribution to Chinese language, screen feminism, with specifically Hong Kong characteristics since 1997. So now I'm going to hand it over to Professor Xu Qingcui. And Ping, could you go to the last slide that will show the artwork? First, th thanks Ping and Fei to uh, help my chapter in the book. And also I will share five minutes to uh, add explanation to the uh, cover page, the image of the cover page. And I'm not the speaker for this panel, but my job is to add uh, some explanations to the image here. So I'm not going to talk about my chapter, I'm going to focus on the image itself, especially the cover page. So if you have a book, you have a, a hard copy in your hand, and what you see from the book cover is the detail of Jiang Jie's uh, sculpture installation over 1.5 tons a fleek shaped monster hanging over the ceiling of the ex ex exhibition hall. Uh, but this is the detail, you know, just a part of the entire artwork. First, I'm going to talk about where started, like a material. I'm going to focus on material. Artists play with the material, then use the notion of a materiality to gender, you know, or to elaborate what it does mean by feminism, you know, through artwork and specifically the material. So the first one is the designation. The artist uses multiple materials, fiberglass, diet lace, 
and iron hooks to negotiate or transgress the boundaries of masculinity and the femininity. That's the purpose of that, and also construction and destruction, corporeal and psychological. And the process, the process of working, the process of design for, for the piece, for the project. So the foundation or primary uh, material form of the sculpture is made of uh, metals. The inside structure, the shape, the form is metals. We understand for sculpture, right? Metal materials, either iron, or steel, or bronze, are traditionally associated with stability, durability, strength, hence masculinity. However, the artist, you know, play with the material, subverts the social and the visual conventions by wrapping and sealing the noble material and the masculine form with dyed lace. So play with the uh, fabrics and material. The supersession of uh, uh, the metal by fabric is a radical, radical reserve, reversal. The soft confines the hard, the feminine, uh, the feminine dominates the masculine. So in, in, in doing so, create kind of a material tension between softness and the resilience. In considering how to color the sculpture at the end, right? The shape is done, the form is done, and Jiang Jie considers how am I going to color this uh, phallic archetype here? So the artist turned to fabric, especially lace, for wrapping and the coloring materials. So the phallic object structured by iron fiberglass is enveloped, embraced in layers, layers of a soft fabric. So creating a material encounter where softness and the toughness clash and simultaneously embrace. So to do so, they create kind of a tangible feel of uh, textiles, which resembles a woman's bodily texture and the temperature and generates a sensation of a kind of sexual intercourse through material blending. Inside is fiberglass, outside is soft fabric, so material blending. In the symbolic sexual encounter, the powerful and the masculine is subordinate to the feminine when wrapped by the fleshy, drapey laces. As a result, the phallic symbol or archetype, once un unbendable and strong, yields to the feminine counterpart. In doing so, the phallic part object wrapped first by the feminine sexual fabric, then constrained by the sculpture materiality, bows to the artist's designation and the discursive reversal. Couple more points here. And the notion of uh, fabricability, which is the fabric ability to shape and the frame its object. The sculptor of over 1.5 tons has used textiles precisely to challenge and refute an iron steel counterparts. The artist used material less to insert femininity or identity, less, that's my argument, rather to assert subjective position with woman as the creator able to shape the phallic symbol and rewrite the conventional discourse of gender politics. Uh, finally, in other words, the feminine could challenge as well as subvert the masculine through its flexible, contradicting materiality. In addition, the intercourse of metal and lace suggests intermateriality on the one hand and the transmateriality on the other. That is, when objects cross material boundaries, they may simultaneously disturb 
discursive realms. There's only anecdotes about images on the book cover. Hope I provide some explanations here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sui. That's fascinating. And, and, and also, thank you for helping us to get permission from the artist Zhang Jie so that we can use, you know, an image of this wonderful artwork as our cover design. Just thank add you. a note that when I first saw the artwork, the sculpture installation, it's intuitive. I have to write something like uh, about the work. It's so powerful, so disturbing, especially to the spectatorship. So that's the motivation behind me to finish this chapter. Yeah, you are very right. It's, it's powerful in a very disturbing ways. And, and also, it's also kind of intuitive when Pia and I saw the images in your chapter, we like immediately made the decision we want to use one of the images as our book cover design because it illustrates very well, you know, this theme of plurality, you know, pluralistic thinking, you know, in Chinese feminisms. Well, um... We want to have some questions. There's a few questions, and uh, we have till uh, we have 25 more minutes now until we're. I had just one real quick question uh, from Ping Zhu's uh, first presentation. Uh, could you just explain a little bit more when, when you said uh, must not reject totalities? I was. Mm -hmm. What yeah, that, you could just that definitely that. needs some explanation. Uh, uh, I did not mean you, like feminism. Feminisms must embrace totality. Actually, it's the very opposite. They must not reject thinking about totality. Totalities, right? They must not reject the the uh, challenging the totalitarian structures, the binary structures that are everywhere in history and in reality. So this this is what I meant by must re not reject because by turning away from any kind of totality, we cannot even think about them, right? So that's what I meant. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, well, there's a, there's a few questions on the q and I can uh, read those out and uh, um, you know, see what you have to say. Uh, there's first one here is, uh, could you share your ideas about current online decentered feminism such as Doban radical feminism? They, maybe you 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 are better. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can, I can say a few words, you know, to respond to this question. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not sure if, uh, you know, I really understand what 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 uh, you know this person means by radical feminism. Uh, because sometimes I, I visited, you know, the Douban app or the website, so I kind of, uh, I'm familiar with this uh, social media platform. So basically, I would say I, I just thought, you know, uh, introduced it to my students, you know, basically it's like a Chinese uh, equivalent to, you know, IMDB and and probably also Rotten Tomatoes. So basically it's a website and social media platform to publish film reviews and, and book reviews. And also there are various kind of you know, groups centered on, on a specific theme. So people will go there and, 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 and you know, like uh, publish uh, their posts and discussing a certain issues. And some of the you know, uh, Doban groups are centered on feminist, feminist uh, uh, issues and ideas. Um, so I, I would say, you know, because for uh, contemporary Chinese feminist activists, you know, like the third cohorts uh, discussed in Wang Jin's chapter, uh, you know, they used uh, a, a lot of social media as their platforms to spread ideas and also to organize, you know, cultural and social activism online and also offline. So and, and uh, originally one of the most prominent um, Chinese feminist uh, accounts uh, called uh, feminist voice. Uh, they also had a, they also had a, a Douban uh, group there. So they published a lot of articles discussing a series, you know, uh, gender specific issues and and organized some, you know, uh, online offline campaigns, and also some of the LGBTQ activists also published articles discussing, you know, their issues and also advocacy. Uh, programs there, but um, the feminist voice account was just, uh, you know, closed, 
you know, because of the, a, a new round of uh, tightening of the public space. So now when you go to a lot of, you know, current Doban groups on, you know, feminist ideas, I would say they are mostly, you know, probably belong to, you know, uh, this this a school of uh, probably like a popular uh, liberal even neoliberal feminism so you see a lot of gender antagonism there so it's, it's a lot uh, a lot of you know um, like uh, men bashing uh, that kind of discussion uh, in and also uh, the dominant ideas you can see there is very much about, you know, a group of younger uh, generations who are better educated and urban based, uh, you know, urban professional young women. So they talk a lot about, you know, uh, like a, a self-expression, uh, you know, and uh, individual and personal uh, success, happiness. So this type of more like a popular or neoliberal feminism. And I think that is like the dominant trend uh, in a lot of Doban groups that you can find there. And so it's, it's, it's very difficult to find, you know, the, any substantial discussion or critique of, you know, uh, the intersection of gender and the class to talk about, you know, how this ongoing neoliberal capitalism uh, exploits and also oppresses, you know, both men and the women, you know, of younger generations in contemporary Chinese society. So I consider that a pity, but after, you know, a new round of closure of many, you know, feminist accounts and LGBTQ accounts. So, so, so I think that's what we can see for the remaining you know, popular Doban groups. Yeah, so this, I didn't really do any systematic research about this. So this is more like my like personal observation. Um, all right, um, I'm gonna read another one here. And uh, um, this is, uh, uh, in the current discussion among Western feminists or American, I'm not actually sure about other countries, there is a debate about how sometimes feminists from white Western countries tend to push their own cultural ideas and standards and norms onto other non-white cultures when judging how feminists, how feminist a culture is or is not. Um, have Chinese feminists responded at all to these kinds of these kinds of feminists? And if they have, what kind of responses have you seen? Uh, I can answer this question. It's a good question. And uh, definitely the answer is yes. Uh, I listed the cover uh, for the volume uh, edited by Chen Shunxing and Dai Jinghua, uh, Women, Race, and Nationalism. In that volume, they collected a lot of the writings from the third world, not the first world. Actually, uh, to talk about first world feminism in today's China, at least uh, within the academic circle, would always invite questions such as, is it appropriate to just transplant uh, this kind of feminism to China? And in this volume, you will see how uh, Chinese uh, women writers or feminists, they are resisting the idea of feminist because feminist has been by default, uh, feminism by default is associated with uh, white feminism or Western feminism. So Wang Anyi's interview, for example, in this volume, am I a feminist? She keeps saying no. She does not want to be a feminist because she claims feminist to be Western, uh, kind of defined as uh, feminism. So yes, there's a lot of pushback uh, in Chinese uh, in, in Chinese uh, practices and uh, theories against the Western feminism, especially after 1990 uh, when a new leftist ideology rose in China. Right. So if I can add a, a couple of words there. So basically, as we said, of course, you know, uh, since its birth, Chinese feminism has been, you know, a part of the global and also transnational feminism. So they shared a lot of, you know, central issues and concerns, uh, you know, with the transnational global or a lot of times, you know, Western centered uh, feminist ideas. But at the same time, you do see a lot of, you know, uh, Chinese feminist uh, thinkers and also activists they try to, you know, on, you know on, on the one hand, they are trying to, you know, find their own identity, you know, uh, 
in this age of globalization. So it's, in a sense, you, you can you can see that as a process of uh, spatialization of Chinese feminism, you know. And and on the other hand, you also see, you know, they emphasize if you really want to spatialize, you know, the identity of Chinese feminisms, and then you have to uh, go back to Chinese history, the local context uh, to negotiate uh, with, you know, the, the, the imported Western gender theories and, and feminist ideas. So, so that, that is why we want to emphasize both things. So both spatiality and, and then temporality. And I think both are very important for us to understand the plurality of you know uh, Chinese feminisms, you know in its plural form. And also another thing I forgot to mention, you know when uh, when when you know uh, summarizing uh, each chapter of, of this book. So we have uh, twelve chapters in total, in addition to the introduction chapter. And five essays, five chapters have been translated from Chinese into English. So basically, we want to demonstrate that you know Chinese feminist thinkers and activists, they are not only you know like a passive recipients of Western ideas and the theories. They are also, you know, active contributors to global feminisms. And I think that should also be in this plural form. Uh, yeah, um, because English allows you to put an S on, on feminism and say feminisms, I, I'm just curious, have you have a Chinese translation or a Chinese version of this, uh, the title of this book? Um, well, that you don't have to answer that now, but then. <laughs> right, yeah. So you you cannot really say new Chuan Zhu Yi Men. It's no. it's, 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 it's not it's not uh, possible. But the thing is, you have multiple translations of, of of feminism in Chinese. So, and I think that already speaks to the plurality of this form, uh, of this term, or its its meaning, its interpretation, and and its uh, you know cultural and historical manifestation in the Chinese context, like new Chuan Zhu Yi, new Xing Zhu Yi, and then you also have Fu Nu Jie Fang, Nan Nu Ping Deng. So. And yeah, well, this book cannot be published in China anyways. <laughs> so we yeah, never bothered well. <laughs> about thinking of a Chinese translation. It won't yeah, be yeah. marketed in China in current political atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, very one true. Of the, one of the fascinating things I find is uh, you translate titles of, of Chinese books in, in a lot of your footnotes. And, and they, they, they're really, to me, and stupendous and, and remarkable translations. Because uh, uh, many times I look at these titles and I I can't immediately think of how to translate them, but you guys have done a fantastic, fantastic job. Um, I'll go on and read one more question. We still have a few. Oh, we have a bunch more that have come in. Um, here's one here. The, the ideas of plurality and an intersectional feminist perspective are very fascinating. Although Professor Zhu has already reinforced the value of intersections of race and gender in her book and of class and gender about feminist socialism, I'm fully aware of tensions and even conflicts among race, class, and gender. Do you find any tensions and conflicts in the social, political, and social context of China? And how do tensions and conflicts represent, represented in Chinese literature, popular culture, uh, how are they represented in Chinese literature, popular culture, and other uh, contexts? How can we as feminists better deal with these tensions and conflicts? That may be a very complicated question, but... Mm. Complicated. Oh, let me try to answer it. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Li Ting. Right. Uh, thank you for the question. I think conflicts and uh, uh, tensions exist everywhere, and that's why we have culture and literature, right? In the first place, without tensions or conflicts, there there wouldn't be any culture or literature to speak with. And I I, I do think they are uh, uh, the, the the interest of class or gender or nation. They are not totally aligned with each other. It is true. Uh, but if you want to look for a root cause for equality, maybe they will. You will find something that can unite race, gender, and uh, and uh, 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 class, right? So of course, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I think I'm trying to push everyone to socialist feminism again. If you if you look at uh, what is the problem, uh, that what is the to problem of totality that we face in the contemporary age, it is capitalism, right? So because our world order is made, is shaped by capitalism. So that is why if you look at this root cause, then I don't think there are a lot of tensions or differences or conflicts. But if you look at things individually, and in isolation, yes, there's a lot. So that's why I, I want to propose 
feminisms with Chinese characteristics as a dialectic, dialectic way to uh, evaluate things and to, to solve our problems. I, I hope that can answer your question. All right, well, I'm gonna go through these in, in order. Um, the next question is, can, and this perhaps is an inevitable one, but not, not so easy to answer. Uh, can speakers summarize the Chinese characteristics in a few sentences? Okay, that's a theoretical question. I can answer that. I can say that no, we cannot summarize Chinese characteristics in a few, a few sentences because it is not a singular thing and it is changing. And it is changing because there are feminists, right? So uh, I can only say that Chinese characteristics have been shaped at, in, in binary structures. And this means the historical mission of feminist, feminists are far from being done yet. We have to keep attacking it until we have true equality. So uh, sorry, there's no fixed definition for this ongoing binary structure war yet. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's my answer. Right, so it's more like it's, it's more like the interpretation, also manifestation, of the meaning of this phrase actually shifts, you know, in different historical and social political contexts. Um, another attendee uh, asks uh, about uh, Taiwan. Why is there no Taiwan in this book? We actually wanted, we thought about inviting uh, someone who can write about Taiwan, but we, uh, within the limited time, we couldn't find one. There, of course, every volume comes with some pities, right? For example, we didn't even ask a male contributor to write something for the volume. Uh, we don't want to give the impression that only females can be feminists, right? So uh, yeah, uh, if we had a longer time, probably we would include Taiwan, we would include diasporic Chinese communities as well, but uh, yeah. we, we were not able to do so. And uh, we're glad that we have a chapter on Hong Kong, right? So uh, hopefully it's, it's something worth reading already, yeah, in, in its own scope. Right, because Gina responded to our call for papers, you know, for the ACLA conference held in 2017. So that is why, you know, we, we are very lucky. We are blessed to have Gina's wonderful chapter on Hong Kong. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, no one working on, you know, feminism in Taiwan responded to our call for papers. And then as Pin said, within the time limits and, and, and all the logistic, you know, obstacles. So that is why, you know, it's a, it's a pity that in this volume, we cannot, you, you know, include everything, but it's already a very thick volume. So, so I don't know if the publisher would allow us to add one more chapter there. Um, all right. Um, another question from somebody who just asked a little bit ago, uh, what is the place of, sections, of sex and sexuality rather than feminism and gender in this project? I think actually Professor Choi's chapter kind of deals with sex and sexuality, but the gen, uh, but the uh, whole volume actually mainly deals with feminism and the gender instead of sex and sexuality. But we do have one chapter, and Professor Choi just elaborated her analysis uh, in 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 the short talk. So it's not a volume of sex and the sexuality. You are right, uh, Calvin. <laughs> Um, then um, another question is, uh, how do we situate the post-feminism discourse in the mapping of this book? Is post-feminism displacing the real issues, uh, real quote-unquote issues of feminism colluding with neoliberal consumerism, or is it part of the pluralistic expressions of Chinese feminism? Post-feminism is post-Western version of feminism, right? I, I want to, uh, uh, like, uh, it depends on what feminism are you talking about. Uh, for, for us, for this volume, it actually affirms feminism are never post, right? It is ongoing, it is still unfolding, and uh, uh, we needed it more than ever. But there are some kind of feminisms, specific forms of feminisms that would uh, uh, go through historical metabolism, let's say. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I, I personally do not agree with the, the term post-feminism. I don't know in which context are, are we discussing this, but uh, if, you in, if you say it's, it's post-liberal, neoliberal feminism, probably we're seeing 
kind of it's uh, it's decline, right? But uh, if you are talking about socialist feminism, it's actually on the rise. So it really depends on what kind of feminism. And please bear in mind, feminisms are plural. So uh, one type of feminism goes down doesn't mean the others will go down with it as well, right? That's my interpretation. Right. So if I understand this correctly, I remember uh, probably it was Nancy Fraser who wrote an article about post-feminism. So basically in the Western context, you know, I, I think this is more like a more conservative, you know, uh, way of thinking and saying, you know, f feminism, you know, the, the uh, advocacy agenda of feminism is not relevant anymore in today's world. So that is why it's called post-feminist age. So or more like end of feminism age. Uh, but of course, you have a lot of, you know, uh, feminist scholars and cultural critics who oppose uh, this, this opinion. And, and then in the Chinese context, and I think uh, Xue Pingzhong wrote on, uh, published on a Chinese article. So the Chinese equivalent to this uh, post-feminism in the Western context would be something like a post-women's liberation. So uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, conservative, you know, uh, uh, Chinese intellectuals and scholars, you know, because they bid farewell to, to the age of revolutions. And they would also say women's liberation is not relevant anymore in today's China. Uh, so so in, in that sense, and I will say probably, you know, we should be very wary about this kind of uh, thinking. And, and just like Pin said, we should emphasize, you know, because exactly because of today's social political and also cultural context, because of all the going on, you know, class and also gender and ethnicity related, you know, uh, issues and problems. That is why, you know, um, we need feminism, feminisms in its plural form in, in, in today's China and also in today's world to deal with, you know, a series of, you know, uh, issues at the intersection, again, of class, gender, and race. OK, well, we really are, are getting near to um, our, our end point. So um, I think I'll just pick one more question. And, and uh, just everybody keep in mind that we, we can't go much past 8.30 because we have a, a session with grad students after this. Um, uh, here's a question that's. Uh, um, uh, for Professor Xiao, what do you think of the relations of feminisms in China to youth culture and fan culture in particular? There seem to be a lot of political as well as non-political transcultural exchanges. Oh, thank you. Uh, that is a, that is a very interesting, a wonderful question. And actually, in my previous book talk or joint book talk, I, I, I particularly deal with you know another intersection. So at this time, intersection of age. And, and, and the gender, because uh, for younger generations, and I think, and also you can also say at the intersection of age, gender and the class, because uh, for today's younger generations, both, uh, you know, men and women, male and the female, and they are faced with very different, you know, uh, issues and the challenges. Uh, so it's not only about all kinds of, you know, uh, newly revived gender hierarchies and also, you know, new forms of exploitation of their, you know, both physical and also immaterial, uh, mental, creative, and emotional labor. Uh, so that is why you do see a group of, you know, uh, uh, younger generations, they uh, participate in uh, social activism and they make the best use of social media. So uh, I talked about, you know, the feminist voice uh, account, you know, on Douban and also they have, they used to have, you know, WeChat and, and, and Weibo accounts to spread their ideas and to organize their you know, uh, campaigns. And a lot of times, uh, you are very right, you know, you, you see a lot of transnational circulation exchange of popular culture. So that seems uh, non-political or apolitical, but uh, those uh, younger activists, and actually they are very creative in adapting and transforming those non or apolitical art forms into something political. 
and uh, you know, and pushing forward their advocacy programs. So I, I guess you know, with the time limit, I cannot really give you very specific examples. But if you are interested, and then you can read uh, another book by mine. And uh, for the for the last two chapters, I talked a lot about you know the online offline uh, use activism and making the best use of transnational apolitical popular cultural forms so that they can speak directly to younger generations and to build up a kind of transnational community, not only of fans, but also of volunteers and activists. Well, okay, I think we've uh, <laughs> come to the uh, 8.30 mark, so um, we'll, we'll uh, call it uh, uh, the end of this phase. And then uh, Akiko, you're gonna take, mm -hmm. uh, take it to the next phase. Yeah, just I wanted to thank uh, uh, for the wonderful book talk. Uh, yes. We promote this kind of diverse perspective and debate. It was perfect. And this like a generating discussions question demonstrate how people are so much fascinated about the topic. And you guys did an amazing job. So thank you again for the professors, uh, Zhu, Xiao, and Zui, and uh, Macman and also the audience who uh, attended and asked the question. Thank you so much. Please stay warm and safe. And for the graduate students, enjoy your discussion with the professor till after this. Thank you again. Have a good night. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank everybody. you bye -bye. Bye. so much.